Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Keith Franz from the Baltimore law firm of Azerill, Gann and Franz. Our firm is dedicated to advancing the cause of victims' rights through civil justice, especially where there has been no criminal responsibility or accountability, and where justice has not been fully served through the regulatory process. I'm here today with members of my firm and will be glad to answer any questions you might have following my prepared remarks. With us today is Tanya Wilt, who is the wife of Michael Wilt, the bulldozer operator who was tragically killed in the high wall collapse of April 17, 2007. Also with us today is Nicole Hare, who's in the back and Anna Wilt, who are Mike's daughters and are also parties in the action being filed today. We are honored to represent the Wilt family in this important case, and we appreciate their presence today. They have asked to not be interviewed or make a statement today, and we ask that you respect their wishes. Their husband and father's death is still ever present for them. They still grieve. And they asked me to provide you with their sentiments and their desire to move forward through this civil action. In regard to their sentiments, let me begin by expressing the sorrow and heartfelt condolences that the Wilt and the Jones family extend to those families of the miners who were tragically killed last week in the Massey mine disaster in West Virginia. To them, they say, we honor your loved ones, we pray for your comfort, and we feel your pain. The community of miners is a very close one, and just as the extended coal mining family provided comfort to the Wilt and Jones families, they now reach out to these new families whose pain is much fresher hoping to provide them with strength through this impossibly challenging time. Ladies and gentlemen, today we announce the filing of a civil lawsuit on behalf of the survivors of Michael Wilt and Dale Jones against the operators of TriStar Mine, their mining engineers, their safety training expert, and the mine's landowner who are responsible for the conditions that allowed this catastrophic failure of the high wall to take place. The tragic facts are these. Easily detectable, substantial problems existed in this mine. These defendants let this environment exist and perpetuate while for years they failed to notify the U.S. Mine Safety and Health Administration of these conditions, as the law requires. And within this mine, uniquely dangerous conditions existed at the spot where this tragedy unfolded. You see, there were abandoned underground mines that had been abandoned for decades. The mining began underground in this area in the late 1800s. The mines were abandoned in about 1930. And you can see from these photographs that the strata had been highly compromised. In fact, what happened was the pillars that supported the rooms from which the coal was excavated had crumbled to rubble. And the ceilings of the uh, rooms had collapsed and subsided onto the floors. You can see here's a wooden pillar that was on the side of the, uh, the high wall. So there was no support from the bottom that was sustainable. In addition, if you look at the map from MSHA, it shows that there were fractures in the rock. These lines here indicate fractures. This is the area that had failed. And there were fractures that you can see go back as much as 100 feet. 
in the rock face on both sides, and consequently, there was no support laterally either for the rock on the high wall. And lastly, following the winter freeze and, and spring thaw, there had been rather deep tension cracks that you can see here. This is on the top of the high wall. Tension cracks into which substantial amounts of water had fallen. You can also see a swarm of tension cracks in this photo over here. This is at the top of the, of the high wall. The consequence was that in the four days preceding this terrible incident, there was a rainfall event of two and a half inches. The rain fell for four days, and with the weight of the, of the rain and these other conditions, the rain got behind the wall and it left a wall totally unsupportable in every direction. It created a recipe for disaster, and disaster struck. This did not have to happen. Sensible people, exercising good judgment for the safety of their workers, would have certainly avoided this. Safety in this case would not have cost anything. It was simply a matter of exercising common sense. But even with rocks being seen falling into the pit the morning of this tragedy, none of the supervisors stepped forward. Each one of these four conditions, the rock fractures, the abandoned underground mining, the tension cracks, and the heavy water infiltration are known dangerous conditions at a coal mine. But when all four exist at the same time, it is potentially earth shattering. All four of these conditions were known to TriStar, and yet they put these men down in that pit. The law of gravity is unkind, and thus their fate was sealed. At 10 o'clock that morning, an avalanche of boulders amounting to 93,000 tons of rock rained down on them, burying their huge equipment and trapping the miners inside. So much of the high wall fell that it took four days of heavy excavation to reach and recover their bodies. For their conduct and negligence, TriStar was issued six citations by MSHAW. They consented to having violated all six laws, and they paid a penalty of over $100,000. These violations were for inspection of the high wall, failure, inspecting the site as required by law following a heavy rainfall event, failure, maintaining a record of the observed hazardous conditions, and there were many, failure maintaining the requiring benching on the high wall so that it would step down and not be susceptible to a catastrophic failure. Failure. And they were cited for specifically placing these miners in highly dangerous conditions. The mine safety 